The Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing efforts throughout rural America. Since 1971, HACC has provided below market financing for affordable housing and community development, technical assistance and training services, research and information products, and policy formulation to enable solutions for rural communities. Welcome to today's webinar, Scaling Down to Address Rising Costs. The second webinar in our Build Smart series is designed to share innovative solutions to affordable housing developers dealing with escalating prices and implementing additional regulations. Today, we will continue the series by sharing solutions to reduce square footage and overall costs while increasing energy efficiency. Presenters will showcase several projects that are transforming communities and sustaining affordability through development of scalable, agile, and resilient delivery processes for beautiful, well-designed, high-performance homes in under-resourced rural communities. Today's webinar is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Eddie Latimer is the founder and CEO of Affordable Housing Resources, Inc. For 30 years, the organization has helped over 18,000 people buy their first home through HUD homebuyer education classes. They developed a full cycle lending continuum offering first mortgage loans and down payment and closing cost loans to first time lower income minority home buyers and have constructed and rehabbed over 14,000 affordable homes. Rusty Smith has been on the faculty at Auburn University since 1998 and became associate director of Rural Studio in 2007. He spearheads the Front Porch Initiative, formerly known as the 20K Initiative, managing multifaceted effort to mitigate the rural housing crisis through both affordable quality home construction and national coalition building for home procurement. His interests include project-based teaching and learning as well as housing affordability. Sherry Trent has 18 years of experience in affordable housing development, acquiring expertise in mortgage financing, down payment assistance, rental housing, homeowner rehab, and single family. In 2003, she developed a homeownership assistance program with the new regional home consortium. She was selected as the director of housing programs in 2007 for a regional planning district and facilitated program growth through partnerships with local county governments and municipalities. In 2018, she became the executive director of Eastern Eight. So hey, hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Rusty Smith, Associate Director of Auburn University's Rural Studio. And we're delighted to be part of the Housing Assistance Council Smart, uh, Build Smart webinar series. For my part today, I'm gonna to take about 15 minutes to talk about how Rural Studio is working with partners like Affordable Housing Resources and Eastern Eight to build smaller, to build scale. First, I'm gonna introduce Rural Studio's Affordable Housing Research and Technical Assistance Program that we call the Front Porch Initiative and we're gonna share some key insights into our multidimensional approach to addressing equitable access to high performance affordable housing. I'll then share a bit of high level information about the work we're doing with AHR and Eastern Aid in Tennessee, as well as a bit of background uh, on a disaster recovery project that we're working on in the Florida Panhandle. After that, Eddie Latimer, who's the CEO of Affordable Housing Resources and Sherry Trent, Executive Director of Eastern Aid CDC, We'll share more detailed information on our partnerships in both Nashville and Johnson, Tennessee, respectively. After that, Sherry, and Eddie, and I look forward to the conversation relative to our common goals in addressing the deep systemic barriers to equitable, affordable, efficient, and resilient homeownership in the communities that need it most. Rural Studio is a, is a design build program in which architecture students between the ages of 19 to 23 years old spend anywhere from one semester to as many as two years of their five years of undergraduate education. As a hands-on program, Rural Studio was founded around a handful of simple premises. First, we embrace the idea that the best way to learn how to do something is by actually doing it. Rural Studio is action-oriented and we try to get things done. Second, we have found that when faced with difficult problems, it's always best to tackle them together. So Rural Studio is extraordinarily team-oriented and we always work with ex external collaborators like you all here. Combined with our uh, belief in the importance of action with our penchant for teamwork, 
Rural Studio acts not just as a research think tank, but also sort of a do tank as well. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we believe that everyone, no matter their circumstance, deserves a safe, durable, healthy, and dignified place to call home. So Rural Studio has always been a housing first organization, which means before it can begin to address the um, broader issue Rusty, I think you're muted. There we go. We just lost you for about 20 seconds. Ah, sorry about that. So, so what I was saying is that Rural Studios, thank you for that. So uh, Rural Studios always been a housing first organization, which means that we can begin to address the broader issues faced in our um, low wealth communities. We must first make sure that everyone is decently housed. Although as shown here, however, Rural Studio students have designed and built well over 200 projects for our community, including more than just houses. Um, they're projects like resource uh, learning centers, libraries, town halls, fire stations, boys and girls clubs, a lot of healthcare and educational facilities, and lots and lots of parks and recreational work. Suffice it to say, if our community needs it, our students can design it and build it. So why is why do we do that kind of this kind of work? If our um, if we really take this sort of housing first approach, well, one of the best examples uh, if, if for us to talk about this is to share uh, a story about the fire station that four of our students designed and built in New Bern, Alabama. So while working on uh, developing affordable housing prototypes, the students came to realize pretty quickly that one of the significant barriers to affordable home ownership in our community was the lack of adequate fire protection. But why was that really a problem? Well, because houses were burning down at an inordinate rate. And why was that a problem? Well, that meant that you couldn't get homeowner's insurance. And why was that a problem? Well, if you can't get homeowner's insurance, you can't secure a mortgage. And of course, as you all know here, if you can't secure a mortgage, no amount of work that we might do as architects by designing the house this way or building it that way would ever begin to solve this problem. So it's in this way that Rural Studio works across the whole system of housing access. First, by revealing and understanding the deeply systemic issues faced by our rural communities, and then by bringing together stakeholder partners across all areas of influence who through collaboration can begin to address these challenges. So as part of our ongoing research to better understand the barriers to equitable housing access in our community, Rural Studio students have also designed and built numerous affordable housing prototypes over the years. And following are just a few of the critical lessons that we have learned along the way. First and foremost, it's essential that housing be designed to be durable, buildable, weatherproof, and secure. But this is just the minimum of requirements. We also believe that successful housing designs should be aspirational as well. Housing should directly express a sense of presence and dignity for the homeowner. It should intentionally foster a sense of community and engagement in its design. And housing should actively contribute to the health and well being of those that live in the homes as well as for those that build the homes. And it should provide opportunities to both age in place with dignity as well as shelter in place and safety. And finally, even though our houses are intended for local people and built with local materials and with local labor and know-how, above all else, they must be well-crafted. So I'm gonna take just a few minutes to give you a brief introduction to Rural Studios Housing Affordability Technical Assistance Program called the Front Porch Initiative. This initiative seeks to extend the impact of our applied research relative to housing access and affordability. As such, we offer housing products and technical assistance to external housing providers currently working to deliver homes in their own often under-resourced communities. In our own service area in West Alabama, Rural Studio works in sort of a mutual aid model where our students design, build, and ultimately provide housing to homeowners that under no circumstances could provide a home for themselves via more traditional means. In return, acting as real life clients, the homeowners play an invaluable role in our students' architectural education. From this, the Front Porch Initiative simply takes the knowledge and products we have developed through this work in West Alabama and shares it with housing providers outside our own service area 
so that they in turn can provide the same energy efficient, resilient, and healthy homes to their clients of need and through their own procurement models. We currently have five product lines of houses, each named after the first client to own each of the prototypical homes. Each of the one and two bedroom houses are small, but they're not tiny. They're designed to be as efficient and durable as they can be, meet all conventional code and lending requirements, be titled as real property, and lived in normally. So here in this image, you see we have Dave's house, MacArthur's house, Joanne's house, Sylvia's house, and Buster's house. In the Front Porch Initiative uh, program, we share our knowledge on what to build relative to codes, universal design standards, lending and insurance requirements, and the like. And we also share our know-how, where we show what to build through a comprehensive set of construction documents and specifications for each of the houses. We're currently working with a network of field test partners throughout the Southeast, and here's one of the early examples of homes built in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia. Through these partnerships, we have learned a number of things. First, it's not only important to show what to build, we now know we have to show how to build it, and even more importantly, why it's built that way. In our work, understanding why we build a home in a certain way is key to addressing the fundamental challenges of affordability. While it's certainly important to ask, what does a house cost to build? We ask it all the time. It's perhaps more useful to consider what a house actually affords. In other words, what impact might we have on affordability if we could begin to consider the total cost of homeownership and the overall financial equation? Or maybe even more directly, we have found that our homeowners are not primarily challenged because they can't afford their mortgage. Instead, they're mo more often at risk of losing their home because of one or more of the four following circumstances. First, they may have an unexpected energy bill. In our part of the world, our homeowners may have an energy bill of $35 to $45 a month in April and May, and an energy bill of $350 to $400 in January or February. The second thing that happens, they may have an unexpected maintenance or repair bill. We live in an area of highly volatile climactic, climactic activity. Maintenance and repair due to storm-related events and the long-term displacement it often causes plays a significant role in the financial security of our homeowners. Third, our homeowners might have an unexpected health care event in their lives. And the fourth area of influence on our homeowners' financial well-being is that our homeowners rely predominantly on part-time work, shift work, and seasonal work to make ends meet, and additionally live in highly complex kinship networks in which everything is shared, from housing, transportation, and income, to food, elder care, and child care. Any disruption in these community networks can be disastrous for generations of a family. So in addition to managing the upfront costs of construction of the home, it's even more important and impactful to understand how the actual performance of the home in the four key areas of energy efficiency, durability and resilience, health and well-being, and strengthening of community networks all contribute in profound ways to financial and economic security. So working with our builder partners like Eddie and Sherry, um, the Front Porch Initiative uh, provides the information, knowledge, and know-how around each of these instrumental areas to help them make informed decisions regarding both the quantitative and qualitative aspects of building performance, all of which allows a clear decision tree that considers both the cost and value of action, as well as the hidden cost of inaction. So here you see five variations of Joanne's home built in Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. One of the important aspects of this iterative research is our ability to build multiple versions of each of the homes in various climactic conditions and with different performance objectives as necessitated by our housing partner's particular circumstance. Taken all together, these homes become sort of test and learn laboratories. And this iterative process of evaluating both the cost and value of building performance lends itself to a really highly customizable process and yields a wide variety of housing options and variations. So each house we build offers the opportunity to study different issues of efficiency, resilience, wellness, and community building. One of our most uh, important research questions focuses on finding the balance point between the front end construction cost of improved performance and the back end performance consequences in each of these areas. 
working with our housing partners, we use our homes to explore the pluses and the minuses of different building standards in their delivery. In the case of this example, we use these two houses uh, to better understand the intersection between energy efficiency and resilience. Both of these houses were built to the Fortified Gold Resilience Standard, but while the house on the right was constructed to the Department of Energy Zero Energy Ready Standard, the house on the left was built to the more rigorous Passive House U.S. Standard. And we continue to monitor these houses for ongoing performance comparison and analysis. The knowledge we've gained from this iterative process and informs our ongoing work and helps our housing partners make better informed decisions about the beyond code standards that may pursue, as well as the, constru uh, the construction processes necessary to maximize these standards. So I'm gonna finish up today by sharing a little bit of progress and learning with, like I said, with three of our housing partners. First, Affordable Housing Resources in Nashville, Tennessee. Next with Eastern 8, CDC in Johnson City, Tennessee. And lastly, I'll share a little bit of, of our work with Chipola Area Habitat for Humanity in Mariana, Florida. In Nashville, we have four recently completed one bedroom homes with Eddie Latimer, who's the CEO of Affordable Housing Resources and is here today. These homes utilize a detached duplex zoning, which allows us to build four homes with four separate real property homeowners on just two small narrow lots. The homes are arranged, they're arranged in such a way as to provide front yards, off street parking, and a shared common courtyard space that you see here. And in this project, we worked from beginning to end with the contractor, uh, Barbara Harper, who owns Honeybee Builders, on all technical aspects of home performance. And it's just one example of how we worked with Barbara. We utilized an initial blower door test in the project, not as a test of performance, but rather as a tool to help her quantitatively understand the importance of doing things right and to communicate with her subcontractors um, really early in the process of what doing things right really means. By engaging the contractor directly with the energy consultant and the HERS rater and evaluating building performance at several key moments during construction, we were able to just about meet uh, 2008 energy codes. You can see here, we were just about to meet those 2018 uh, energy expe code expectations while utilizing 2012 energy code requirements for construction. And this was a really important learning opportunity for everyone involved as the impact of doing things right or, or otherwise focusing on construction means and methods and not just on the utilization of advanced materials and assemblies is key to increasing building performance without increasing construction costs. Then earlier this summer, we broke ground on the first of what we hope will be many houses with Sherry Trent, also here today with Eastern 8 CDC in Johnson City, Tennessee. As this project is currently ongoing, I'll let Sherry share you with some details on this project in just a moment. But for us, this is also an innovative and exciting partnership as Eastern Aid is utilizing a HUD Community Development Block Grant to develop a series of demonstration model homes that will allow the community to see in real life what well-designed, small and efficient houses might offer. Eastern Aid is currently building the first model home based on the Sylvia's House product line offering. And while Eastern Aid doesn't currently offer plans for one or two bedroom homes, Sherry believes this model home will attract more interested residents to pursue small unit offerings. Here you'll see an aerial view of the house under construction, and it utilizes what we refer to as a two bar scheme. They're two bars sort of parallel and interlocked with each other, you can see in plan. Um, it, it fits really well on a narrow infill lot on what otherwise might be unbuildable under contemporary zoning size and setback requirements. And as you can see here, even on a tight lot, Sylvia's house fits well within the existing neighborhood fact, uh, fabric and still offers generous space between the neighbors along with great views and easy access to both the front and backyards. And then finally, to finish up in Mariana, Florida, we're continuing this type of technical assistance and learning and have the first of two four infill houses under construction with Carmen Smith, executive director of Chipola Area Habitat for Humanity. In this case, Habitat had several unutilized parcels, not only because of their small size, but also because of their rather steep topography for Florida. The variations of small homes we have, have to offer allows us to handle all kinds of site complexities and configurations. The reason I really wanna share this project is it's also really important as we've also been able to partner with Chipola College's new construction workforce development program to address the much needed workforce piece of the housing affordability puzzle. 
By building these houses themselves in the field, instead of working in the lab at school, Chipola College's building construction technology students are getting clock hour coursework in the field, which counts towards their construction certifications. And they're gaining valuable experience in the means and methods of, construct of constructing energy efficient, resilient, high performance homes right in their own backyard. This, this is a vital component to any, any uh, community's disaster preparedness, mitigation, and recovery plan. To have a ready and knowledgeable local workforce is key in building new homes that are more resilient to the climate-related events that we know are coming and to also build back better in the event that they do. So to finish up from providing equitable housing access and supporting ongoing disaster preparedness and recovery efforts, to educating the workforce necessary to deliver high performance homes, we believe the comprehensive partnerships that we're establishing with partners like Sherry and Eddie are the gold standard in our collective multidimensional approach to the nexus of needs required to truly address the issues of housing affordability. So thanks, we look forward to the following on discussion and please do feel free to reach out to any one of us on our team should you have any further questions, interests, or need more details about this work. Now I'll hand it, on to, hand it over to Eddie and Sherry. Hello, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm Eddie Latimer out of uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and Affordable Housing Resources, and I, and I don't know where my thing is. There it is. Affordable Housing Resources is uh, 30 years old. We are primarily known for our development. We've built and sold um, and rehabbed about 1,500 mostly single-family homes, mostly three-bedroom, two-bath, type things uh, to local people, and it's gone very well for us. The, um, okay, so I'm going to start off with this is why are we doing micro homes? And this actually is a historical newspaper article because believe it or not, they got the story right. And for those of y'all in the field, you understand how hard it is to get the press to understand the story. And, um, this was uh, back in uh, 2014, I was able to go to this thing called uh, the Achievement for Excellence, which is a program that's run out of the Kennedy School for Government up in uh, Cambridge. And my topic was uh, micro homes as a new way to design affordability. And it was based upon the fact that so many singles were moving to Nashville that our population is uh, was, went from 2.4 and it is now officially two. So the smaller home actually made a lot of sense in our environment. But um, it really, and so what we were doing is we were looking at the issue of working uh, with a smaller product and with a better energy cost. Early on, while I was still, when I was working on that, people kept saying, you need to go talk to rural studios. So we finally did get it, made a trip down to uh, Mecca, and um, it was really worth the drive if you ever want to go. And you get to meet all the staff, you get to meet the students, you get to see the creative atmospheres they live in, but you get to see all of the things they've done, which is rather formidable and very uh, exciting. So out of that, we were able to apply for this um, the uh, front porch initiative, and we were very grateful to win. I'm gonna have to, okay, there we go. So the basic info, these are the four homes that Rusty just showed. This is a, we've got a lot of flyers if anybody wants them. Um, this is a flyer that McKenzie and Elizabeth put together and I've just torn it apart, but I can give it to you back in one piece. Well, uh, what we did is we used the, all the material on the exterior is completely maintenance free. Because as you know, a low income person does not need to repaint a house in six years. It, it'll put a dent in their uh, financing. So everything's maintenance free. We had to work a lot with codes. If you're going to do this in an urban environment, you really need to establish a relationship with codes. And I'll give you an example. Is their overhang exceeds uh, Metro Nashville's overhang require, um, allowances. And the reason is, is that extra overhang keeps two hours of sun out of the homes down in South Alabama in the morning and the evening. But um, 
it's not allowed here. So we worked with Coase and they said, all right, we'll allow it and see how this works. Maybe we got something that'll work for other homes in the future. But so that's where Coase conceded, but also home, rural homes and they don't have gutters. And so, but in Nashville, you had to have gutters. So uh, uh, AURS, they worked very closely and created a whole gutter system. And I'll show you where that came in really bad really critically behind this home in just a minute. This is the kitchen. Uh, this is uh, Joanne's home. It's a great kitchen. It lays out perfect. It's very roomy. Um, it's a great workspace. I'll get this right. Okay, we got these little four little homes right here. This is a $738,000 mansion, like 3,500 square feet. And here are two smaller homes. And then over here on this hill, every home over there is between four and six hundred thousand dollars. But then scattered among these are old historic homes. And these lots are only 30 feet wide because they were originally designed just for shotgun homes. So we were able to work with the city. We got an engineer to lay them out. Rusty showed you the layout. But we had to get so we got a lot of people involved in this, which made it a lot more fun. So here's the inside courtyard, and right here, this is all the um, stormwater. So we had to get all the gutters to work so they would all go into this pit, which is then filled with some real expensive material. And, um, but it's very effective. And so we had Nashville's heaviest day of rain in the history of Nashville right after we sodded this. And um, we got out, the rain finally stopped at seven o'clock on Sunday morning. I was out there by eight, and there was no standing water. So all of that design work that they did really made it work on this designation, and that was very important for us. So here's the uh, living room. Uh, I'm standing in that kitchen I just showed you. And so you got a living room. It, it's very spacious. It's very comfortable. This is the bedroom. There's the bath. And behind this wall is a washer and dryer. And, that, and then also the front porch. The homes are great uh, with front porches. They're really made with that rural environment. And in this neighborhood, it's a heavy walking neighborhood. It'll really fit in very well with the social fabric of the community, which is somewhere between the historical poor lower income residents and these uh, up and coming millennials. I do want to go back. One of the things that we also did on this, I can show you this, is we insulated the exterior of the home, not the box. And that made a huge, that was really critical, as you, Rusty showed you that chart, um, to get the air blower test down. If you just insulate the box where you put the insulation and the, the, the uh, beams here, you cannot get the air blower test down. So we did the exterior and that was really critical for us. Also, it allows us to use the upstairs where the attic is, there's the attic, so that you can use that for storage, which is a real problem on small homes. We put in a really good, high quality pull down stairs, not the kind you grew up with, where you, when you weigh 20, you know, 100 pounds, you're scared you're gonna fall off the thing. But this is a great little set of stairs and so you can put all your off-season clothes up there. You can put all your decorations up there. So realizing that, we went ahead and just put uh, plywood, OCB board, all over the attic so that the residents have access to the entire thing. This is the, sh the shotgun home, which is Dave's home. So it lays out really well. You got the kitchen on this one wall. It's very comfortable. Um, this is the bedroom. This is a queen size bed. So everything fits in here very nice and very neat. One thing that's interesting is we did the AC HVAC as a split unit, is a split level unit, but this is an air mover. And so what they had to do to, to make this thing work is you have to exchange the air every hour. So every 20 minutes, they have a fan up in the attic. And so it blows the air out of the living area into the bedroom. So it comes in here and then it takes the air out of here, blows it into the bathroom, and the air in the bathroom is, is pumped out through your exhaust fan. 
So every hour the air exchanges so that it's a very healthy home. Mackenzie and, and Elizabeth, I'm looking at you really hard to see if you're nodding. Yes, I'm getting this right, or if you're you're laughing at me. But so far, I feel really confident. All right, so here's the front porch. It's just it's a great little sitting area. The woman that actually bought the, all four of these homes have sold. The woman that actually bought this home, she's just got nothing but plants out there. So it's, these homes are very livable. Every space is very, is very well used. And at the end of all, at the end of it all, we had a huge ground break uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. Over 200 people stopped by. We made the whole event very political. We had various council people speak, the ones that are really involved in affordable housing. We had codes come and speak because they were so critical and they were real excited about doing this. We had various funders speak. We had the board speak. Auburn spoke, and we even had an Auburn alumni there. We had a lot of Auburn. Uh, architects walking through these homes and their favorite part was the attic by the way but everyone that got to speak um they all we had them all pre preach affordable which is why the newspaper got the article right and so we just were, were able to use this not only to showcase micro but to showcase the need for affordable housing but the the uh the media was very interested in this whole lower energy bill because so we built these homes for 147 to 149. Our three bedroom, two bath and three bath homes are coming in for 190 to 200, just so you have something to compare that with. And with that, I will turn that over to Sherry. Hello, everybody. Let's see if I can get my... Here we go. Okay. Well, um, I'm Sherry Trent and I'm with Eastern Egg Community Development and we're in Upper East Tennessee. Uh, we serve the eight counties here. Uh, we're close to Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, so we have a beautiful part of the world and um, Eastern Egg has been in existence for 23 years now and we have a mission of creating and preserving affordable housing. And um, as you know, that is getting harder and harder to, to do. So uh, we have um, we have about 300 rental units now. Um, and I think that's very important for us to keep and maintain those so we can have affordable housing for rental. And um, then we also develop homes. We help with loans, uh, homeownership programs, down payment assistance. So anything that uh, has to do with housing, we try to to help out with. Um, so we have uh, found a need in um, the last few years of trying to figure out how to, to stay in this market because, you know, with, with the prices going up, you know, we're getting priced out and uh, it's harder and harder to, to make a affordable home work. So I'm going to try to see if I can figure out how to afford my, there we go. Okay, let me go back. You can use the um, arrow keys or there's a button down in the lower left corner. There's a forward and a back button. Sorry. A little the... further to the left. Okay. All right. I see. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, for us to stay in this, this kind of work, we, we needed to try to put some some thought to it and, and figure out how to, to keep this going. And, um, you know, with, with grant money, you never know if you're going to have it or not. So, uh, you know, we took a look at what we had internally as far as inventory of lots and, and partners and things and um, did some research on different things. So I, I checked into um, modular homes. We, we got some prices on uh, those on building those we got prices on manufactured homes and um, they're still it's, I think they're going to be a good option but they're still really not in the price range that, that we can do it so uh, we approached the city of Johnson City on helping us uh, with some funding on um, building the home we had heard about the rural studios uh, 
project with Auburn and uh, Rusty had a call with us and, and uh, we uh, went over some things and I thought, well, this sounds like a fantastic opportunity for us to explore uh, some options. So um, we also are a neighbor works organization and they fund us with different uh, pots of money so that we can use to uh, be creative and uh, you know, look at different options. So, so we put it all together and we decided to, to build a house and um, the Sylvia seemed to fit. Uh, we had a lot here in Johnson City that um, we've had on the books for quite some time and everybody that looked at it told me we couldn't build anything on it because it was too small. And um, it actually worked out perfectly for this, this home. And um, so the city decided they would fund us with a little bit of CDBG money. And, um, you know, we looked for somebody to buy the home and, uh, you know, build it as a uh, home for someone, but you know, these are a little different, so we thought we would um, try to build it first so they could see it and walk in it and experience it. And um, so that's, we decided to build it as a spec and then and make um, uh, available so people can walk through it and learn as we learn. And um, if we don't sell it, then we'll just put it in our rental portfolio. But I think we'll sell it. I think, I don't think we'll have any trouble with the market today. Um, so, you know, as I said, we had CDBG funds, which is, it worked out well because there was a house on this lot before, uh, sometimes CDBG, that's a requirement that you were replacing a home. So we replaced the home. Um, we started the search out for a, a builder. We went through several different, uh, interviews with builders and they were all excited and they would never call us back. Um, so... <laughs> So we've got a local nonprofit uh, here in town uh, that they serve the Appalachia region. It's called Appalachia Service Project. And uh, we met with them and talked to them about uh, them becoming our builder. And uh, they were excited too because they'd heard about the Rural Studios and wanted to see if there was things they could incorporate in their building. So we entered into a contract with them and in April we broke, broke ground and, and uh, got on our way so and you know Rusty's already talked on a lot of this of why we're doing this um, the the houses that we build are are over 200 now our affordable homes are over 200 so um, and that's not affordable for a lot of our population so so we've got to try to keep the cost down um, we've got to uh, maintain long-term affordability you know so the, the electric bills are affordable. So the uh, maintenance is within reason. You know, they can't expect a lot of huge bills coming up. And, and we just want to contribute to the, the uh, affordable housing supply. So, um, so that's kind of why we're doing it. And, um, you know, it's been a really uh, learning uh, process for us. And there's lots of things that uh, uh, that I have learned and and that will carry on to the next project. So we, um, this is a, uh, when we had the groundbreaking, it shows a lot kind of how tight it was, but um, you know, it's, it's allow, allowed us to explore options that maybe we couldn't have, that the expertise that uh, Rural Studios brings is amazing. I mean, you can ask them one thing about changing a window and they'll run it through their models and tell you exactly what kind of energy output you'll have on it. So, so just having that at your hands is, is amazing. Um, we, we've been successful at building homes out in our rural areas because the, the land is uh, pretty more, it, it's, it's more readable to get and um, the financing that Rural development offers for county properties is easier to build a home there at a higher price. So we had the gap of trying to figure out how to finance a home on the non rural development areas. And um, so this is how we're trying to, to make these work is you know, build them more affordable 
and uh, you know work out financing with our different partners and our down payment assistance. And this is a picture of our groundbreaking again, and uh, this is one of the volunteers that work with Appalachia Service Project. Um, and as you know, we're not finished, so we're still in the, the middle of this. So this is the inside, and you can see how roomy it is. I was very surprised once we actually were able to go in and look at it uh, of how much room that we had. Um, so this is the back of the house. There's going to be a porch there. So I love that it's going to have a porch on the, the front and the back. So, you know, the homeowner or the tenant can enjoy sitting out on the porch and uh, visiting with their neighbors. So it's kind of a, a unique house and uh, we're real excited about uh, seeing the, the progress. So there's the siding, the middle siding. I really like the the unique look of it with the, uh, the metal siding and I think it fits really well into this is we, we're in a college town with ETSU and I think it fits real well with the, the atmosphere here. And that's uh, my quick rundown but uh, but we're excited it's the uh, I'll give you some ideas of the cost. Um, we have a contract with a, a Appalachia Service Project for 128,000 to build it. We've actually upgraded and did some granite to try to make it a little more uh, modern. Uh, so that's going to probably add almost 3,000. Um, and as I said, we had the lot um, on our books forever that we couldn't use, and I think we had it booked at 12,000. So that's 143 in. Um, we had an appraisal before it was built at 150. So I think with um, uh, Johnson City putting in 80,000 with CDBG, you know, it'll very easily cash flow for us. So that's kind of our quick rundown. Thank y'all. Do we have any questions uh, from the audience participants? Uh, we've got a couple in the chat, uh, but if you've got a question, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Would you like us to go ahead and jump in and answer some of those? Does we see them? Because I'm happy to do that. Um, I saw Earl, you, you posted a question about uh, do, uh, for for us for Earl Studio. Do we use any type of skirting for the built for the built homes when they're built on piers? Uh, when we when we do build on piers, uh, uh, about half the time we do it depends on you know kind of the owner's desire, the jurisdiction, the insurance requirements, and those sorts of things. But we do have a skirting system that we can use on the houses. Um, but we, you know, depend again, you know, sort of they're they're really flexible depending on kind of what the circumstances are, what the site conditions are, what local requirements are, and those sorts of things. We can build on piers, uh, crawl space, uh, slab, elevated slab. We have uh, sort of options within all of the houses to to build in any of those configurations. Uh, one thing too to that question about substandard the local jurisdictions i mean it's, jurisdictions are so strange how they function but one of the arguments that we find is always effective is you're getting no taxes on this little piece of land that has very little value so if you want to put a house there you're going to get taxes and we've found that more often than not has uh, allowed them to figure out some kind of variance that gives us permission to build on that lot or lots yeah, and Sherry, you you may you may um, uh, you know sort of speak to this similarly, or may experience maybe the same as yours. You know, we we do we work with a lot of Habitat for Humanity affiliates, and and you know the two little houses that I showed you that where I talked about they were a, an experiment and, and kind of understanding how energy and and durability work together. Those two houses were were built on two funny little pie-shaped lots that were unbuildable. The Habitat affiliate, you know, in their traditional three-bedroom or four-bedroom house, they couldn't build on those lots. And so to, to exactly to Eddie's point, um, 
you know, those lots got donated to Habitat years ago because they weren't really buildable. So they weren't worth anything. It took something that really wasn't worth something and made it valuable. Uh, it took a vacant lot out of the community. Uh, it brought another, uh, um, as, uh, as Eddie suggests, it sort of brought another taxpayer to the community. Um, and it brought another, you know, sort of citizen and voter to the community. Well, that, that one habitat uh, has about 60 of those lots in their portfolio that have been donated to them over the year that they're sort of maintaining and those sorts of things. So it's not only unlocked a lot of property that's made it buildable and therefore valuable, it's also opened up the opportunity for an entirely different client base than what that, that those affiliates might normally have. The folks that, that increasingly, as Sherry had talked about, really need that one or two bedroom home not the three or four bedroom home that's more traditionally offered. But Sherry, have you seen that same sort of sort of trend relative to your property holdings and the kinds of clients you're trying to serve? It, it really has opened up a whole new um, market for us, you know, to be able to go in and, and get these smaller infill lots and do something nice and, and something uh, somebody asked about uh, if we had difficult time with the local jurisdictions on the small side lots and and it really hadn't because they want to see those develop too you know they want to see the uh i guess the um, life back into some of these areas that have kind of been in decline for quite some time so um, so i think it's opened up a whole new market for for us on on the i know this is rural but but you know the inner cities I mean, we're, I, I still think of Johnson City as rural, so, uh, but I think it's opened up a lot uh, for us to be able to offer to the city. And um, it actually has led to other projects. We've got a, a properties, uh, there's three lots right behind our office here, downtown Johnson City, that um, uh, the city has wanted to develop and uh, They've actually, we've got a partnership that's uh, formed that they're going to give us one lot to build a home on. They're giving Habitat a lot to build on. And the other Appalachian Service Project, they're going to build a home on. So we're going to all three build homes on a, a lot on a street that hasn't had any activity in forever. Um, so it's exciting. It's exciting. And, uh, Somebody asked about the square footage. Um, I think it's 756 square feet. And yeah, the rest of y'all might check me on that. But. No, that's that's good. I, th I thought that was going to be a test, and you, okay. you passed it. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, all of all of our homes, you know, they they are they they range between you know the smallest one bedrooms from anywhere a little over 500 square feet up to some of the two bedrooms. You know, they start tipping the scales around 900 square feet. Um, and so, you know, all of the houses that we sort of mentioned earlier, you know, they're, they're not, they're not tiny homes. They are, you know, sort of, uh, meet all code requirements and per permitting requirements. And really our goal is that you can live in them normally and that they are, um, you know, meet the accessibility requirements that you might have for, for your homes and all those sorts of things are really important. Uh, visitability uh, was one of the, the key criteria for Sherry and her team that we met uh, sort of visit, visitability standards. And so we worked closely to make sure we were exceeding those expectations um, uh, as, as well. Rusty and also just to add in, our, our lots were given to us by the city. They were on the back tax rolls. So it took yeah. us about five months and about three thousand dollars to get them each cleaned up, but it was it was good. It made it really work for us. You know, one thing, I, if I can, I just one of the things that was really critical for us that came out of that uh, achieving excellence program is how to build smarter, how to build more effective, how to get more control of our costs, and uh, what other ideas could come out of this that would. Um, could impact our other housing. And everything we do is speculative. We never build a home uh, for a person because number one, it speeds the process up by five months because you don't have them uh, asking a lot of questions. But number two is uh, we usually find that homes sell at sheetrock. And uh, the 1500 we've built and sold, most of those have sold at sheetrock. So, the, um, but this, uh, 
front porch initiative in these homes, we feel like it helped us figure out how to do smarter, how to be more effective, how to get our cost under control. We were surprised it was only a few thousand dollars more to build this home to these standards than it was just to build it to your normal uh, energy code standards. It was not that expensive that we thought. We were thinking it'd be eight to ten thousand dollars. It was nothing like that. And um, so I just would really, uh, if y'all are looking at that, I would really encourage you to, uh, to look at this that way because um, the lower light bills are going to make that home more affordable, even though the note will be higher because of the cost of materials that we're struggling with. The lower light bills, the lower energy really does make that home more affordable to the tenant. Yeah, we found, uh, Eddie, along those lines, we found that, um, you know, lowering those, those, you know, costs of home ownership, like, like energy bills and the like, are really important. Stabilizing them uh, so that they're knowable, uh, you know, so from month to month is, is in sometimes even more important um, in our, you know, sort of homeowners sort of knowing month to month what those costs are going to be actually goes a long way towards the affordability. So it's not just getting the cost down, which is really important. It's making them knowable. Um, so month after month is sort of you, you, you can meet your expectations. Um, the Sherry, there was a there was a question about um, the cost per square foot. I know you're still you're still building your houses, but you sort of gave some numbers that you know we could probably extrapolate from. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, it's, uh, you know, if you add all all the cost in, it's about two hundred dollars a square foot, which you know used to be a custom built home, but now that's <laughs> in the affordable range. So. Um, it's, I guess it's all relative to what everything yeah. costs today. And uh, the appliances, we do put all the appliances in. You know, you've got um, a nice stainless package is what we're adding in. Somebody asked about that. Um, the subsidies on lowering the sales price to the assessed value so they wouldn't be burdened with so much uh, a tax bill. So that's a, that's a double-edged sword there because um, mm -hmm. if you... You, you need to sell the house for the appraised value because if you don't, then the next time you go to sell a house, you'll never sell it for. I mean, it because you get you've got a comp on the on the book. So, so we have you know down payment assistance that can help bring that down. Um, there's there's tax uh, there's there's different tax uh, incentives if you you might could qualify for uh, reduced tax property taxes, but. But as far as a subsidy to get the price down, you know, the down payment assistance or the uh, money we leave in the house, like Eddie has done, um, you really need to sell the house at the appraised value. You gotta shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, one of the one of the questions to jump back, you know, the, the question about the square footage cost, it's it's a real it is a real conundrum as Sherry talks about. You know, when when um, when you build small. You, you you strangely do lose um, some kind of uh, efficiencies of scale. So when you build small, you still have to build the two most expensive parts of the house, which is a bathroom and a kitchen. Um, and everything else is just, you know, kind of drywall. Uh, so it's it, it sort of the to, to build once you once you have that bathroom and kitchen to build more square footage doesn't cost a whole lot. So that square footage price does go up, uh, you know, sort of apples to apples between a small house and a large house. Um, but it's still the overall reduction in the cost of the home is still still fairly significant. Um, the, there's a question about uh, providing on-site wastewater. And in, 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 in neither of these projects uh, do our own septic systems. Like both houses are on sewer. But, you know, about half of our work that we're working with on, with partners are in even more rural places where there aren't sewer. And that's a, that's a huge issue, you know, and, and the part of the world where we work in, uh, in West Alabama, you know, really the only option is a septic system and those don't work so great in our soil system. And so that can be, you know, as much as 15 to even $20,000 to engineer a system uh, for the home before you even um, uh, sort of begin to think about building a home. And it's one of the few things you have to demonstrate that you can do when you get a, a loan 
or, or uh, construction loan on a home is to show that you're going to connect to an operating sewer or septic system. So that's a big challenge. We're doing a lot of work in that space at, at, at Rural Studio, both all, relative to uh, sort of how we can actually begin to think about where funding for that kind of work can come from, as well as innovations in uh, sort of on-site wastewater uh, treatment um, that uh, we think are pretty innovative and are going to change change the game a little bit, particularly in rural places where we're um, developing or working with really smart engineers to develop small on-site wastewater treatment facilities that, that work at the scale of a, a small neighborhood or settlement, uh, not at the scale of a large municipality. Um, on the average, on the yeah, we do provide appliances uh, to Tina's question because we are selling these homes at SPAC. And, um, what we do is we give them a stove, refrigerator, dishwasher, and a microwave. But you average those costs out over 30 years. I'm, I know they're paying a lot of interest, but it's a lot cheaper than them going to Home Depot and buying one and putting that dent in their budget or getting another uh, line of credit for that. But it, do, it is critical to have the appliances in a spec home for a low income first time home buyer. We have found. And then, Lindsay, I can sort of respond a little bit to your question about, uh, you asked how difficult it is, it is to add insulation to the entire home um, what, once it's already built. And, and you know, you're not going to like the answer, but it's, it's sort of, it depends. Um, you know, these, these envelope systems that we, that, you know, sort of that's what we call, you know, kind of the building envelope, which is the roof, walls, and, and floor, they're, they're fairly complex. You know, they're doing a lot of things. They're, you know, providing insulation. They're stopping air infiltration. They're, um, you know, sort of reduce reducing humidity in, in a way. So they're asked to do a lot of things, and so to sort of lay another system on top of an existing system that hasn't really been designed all together can can bring a level of complexity to it. So you have to look at the system that you have and sort of see how that system might be supplemented or augmented. Um, so it's, it's really it's really not an easy answer. Um, but I'll tell you that the number one thing, and this is, you know, it's not the it's not the insulation that you really want to focus on. The very first thing you want to you want to concentrate on is air infiltration. So the more you can reduce air infiltration to the house, the more you can tighten it up. And, and we're going to say that there's no such thing as a house that's too tight. You've heard lots of conversations about that over the years, but there is no such thing as a house that's too tight. If you do that, it significantly reduces the need for insulation. The second thing you have to do after you focus on air infiltration is then focus on ventilation. And you wanna ventilate the house on purpose, not ventilate the house because it's leaky, uh, because it's you know got just natural air infiltration, but you want to you want to really focus on the um, ventilation component of it, and that's that goes into the the system that we use that Eddie was sort of alluding to is called an ERV, an energy return ventilator, which allows you to uh, exhaust stale air from the house and bring in fresh air from the house without losing the 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 conditioning or the energy that you put into the air to to condition it or temper it. So it's really air infiltration and ventilation. Those are the two, two places you really want to focus on and then really start thinking about insulation strategies. And we we have these conversations with our with our how with our builder partners all the time. Like these are the kinds of conversations we have about, you know, how do we prioritize and how do we what do we put first and how do we make decisions? How do our how to Sherry and Eddie, how do they make decisions? as they're thinking about uh, the particular um, uh, performance that they're trying to meet with their home. Yeah, you know, at that level. I'm going to um, go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. Well, I was just going to say at that level to do something new, it's you've really got to get your board engaged. And the way you can get through a lot of this stuff, like building a spec home or doing something that's smaller than normal and that kind of thing is just to win over those key board members. I mean, that's just, you can't, you cannot have a meeting about creativity without that fact.
Uh, Sherry, I wanted to add one comment onto yours regarding the lot size. Um, there, there is a lot of information given out here today. I've been building homes for a long time. One of the things that is new to me from your presentation is um, building on substandard smaller lots. A lot of jurisdictions frown on that. And um, lot costs in this day and age are going through the roof and adding uh, tremendously to the cost to build a home. So the fact that you're able to work on these scrap lots or the pieces left over by building a smaller footprint, um, that to me is, is revolutionary in helping bring the cost down. A building lot, um, when I was building, you know, upwards close to $40,000 and, and that's in Florida and, and it just kind of escalates from there. So being able to reduce them on a smaller footprint takes a lot of coordination with the local governing staff and all their rules and their setbacks and minimum lot sizes and NIMBYism and all that goes into that. So I applaud your effort at, at being successful in building on a smaller parcel. I think that is a huge key in keeping the homes affordable is to start with an affordable lot. And if you can get them donated because they're leftover pieces, they still work. The neighbors aren't going crazy. I think you have a, a great concept there to, to keep prices more affordable. Thank you. And I think we're going to try, like Eddie did, to uh, the lot we've got behind our office here. We may try to go ahead and do two. It depends on the city, you know, if they're receptive or, or your area. So we have one jurisdiction that was not receptive and, and one that was. So, you know, it's just it's just a matter of, of who you get and uh, uh, what their thoughts are. Well, Sherry, you'll just have to let them know that that Nashville's got nothing on Johnson City, City, Tennessee. <laughs> so, but I, I think you know, I know, I know we're going to run up against time. But I, what I'll share, just sort of tagging on with that, Earl, is that you know, sort of what we're, I think, what Eddie and Sherry and and, and Rural Studio here is, is suggesting is is not that this is an alternative to other things, but this is in addition to you know, uh, to, to your point about the sort of these these sort of infill lots and those sorts of things. This is for all of our housing partners. This is in, in addition to what they're already doing. It's broadening their portfolio. It's allowing them to touch more clients and homeowners, and it's allowing them to utilize property that they may not in their portfolio that they may not otherwise be able to, to utilize. And so we, we feel that it's a, a great addition to uh, uh, housing providers uh, uh, work that they're already doing. So I'm going to wrap up. Rusty, Sherry, Eddie, so much. Appreciate you guys so much sharing your expertise, your knowledge. I know I've learned so much. Everyone has learned a lot, hopefully, from this webinar. It will be on the website for future viewing. And all three of these folks are welcome. They, they would welcome your follow up to uh, if you want to talk with them further. Please reach out to them because they they love to share. So uh, they are there for your uh, assistance if you need it. Um, thank you for joining us again at Hack for this webinar. We hope you've enjoyed uh, the conversation today, and uh, thank you guys for all this great information. Appreciate you. So much. You're welcome. Thanks, Thanks, Rita. Thanks. Thank you, Rita. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I sound terrible, um, speaking of construction, they just started construction right outside my door, like <laughs> the street creeping up the door. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Thanks, everyone.